The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Today, we are going to discuss building a shed. We'll show you how you can create the shed plans in Envisioneer, create the 3D model, and create some fantastic visuals for it so that you can see exactly what that shed is going to look like and possibly build it even afterwards. We're going to start off by building the shed using one of our design wizards. And then I'm going to show you how you can manipulate that design to create anything that you need to from that. And then carry on to show you how you could even build it from scratch. Once we have that 3D model built, we're then going to translate that into some working drawings using some floor plans, some elevations, um, doing a section through it as well, and then creating those presentation visuals for you. So let's get started. Everyone is going to be on mute for today's class. If you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand in the GoToMeeting console on the right of your screen. You'll see an option that you can raise a hand and ask a question, and I'll be able to see that. And then once we're done the, the presentation, I'll be able to answer the questions for you. So let's get started. To start the design, the easiest way to design a shed is to come to our um, building wizards, and under there you'll see a shed builder. This builder will take us through a series of dialog boxes where it asks us questions, and at the very end of that, it's going to build the 3D model of the shed for us. So let's begin by clicking on the shed builder. The first screen is just a welcome screen, letting you know what we're going to be doing. And I'm going to step you through that so we can simply click next. Next, we have to tell it the style of the shed that we're going to be building. You can see that this first option in the upper left-hand corner is a simple building with a gable roof on it. And then the next one is the opposite where the um, A and the B um, have the gable going in the opposite direction. And then we have a hip roof shed, and then we have a shed roof shed. What this does is allows you to pick the style that best matches the style of shed that you're building so it can create it for you. So I'm just going to create a gable end shed to begin with. To the right of that, it asks us for the length and the width of our shed. So I'm going to make the length, the A, 15 feet, and the width, 10 feet. And that's our B value here in the diagram. Any time that you have any questions while you're making a shed or building anything in Envisioneer, you'll notice that up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a question mark. That is your quick access to help. By clicking on that button, it'll bring up the dialog boxes and step you through all the questions that you might have in that dialog box. So when using the software for the first time, make sure you take advantage of the help options that are there. I am simply gonna click next. Now it wants to know, when it's looking at the front of the shed, what is at the front of the shed? Is it just a door? Is a door in a window, a door in two windows, or a door with a window to the opposite side? I'm just going to choose a door. Then for the sides of the shed, do I want a window on the left and a window on the right? And it'll automatically fit those in for you. Then you simply click next. So what we're doing at this point is just describing the construction of this shed. What style is it? How big is it? Is there doors? Is there windows? Now what we're doing is we're selecting the materials for the shed itself. So here we're going to be describing the roof the walls, the floor, the door, and the windows that we're specifying. All of those can be put into a pre-built configuration package. So you can see that we have one that's already done for wood siding finish, for vinyl, for brick, for a pole barn, or for just a default options. So I'm gonna stick with the wood siding finish. By picking on any of these buttons, I can take the default options that the wood siding finish configuration gave me and customize all of them. So for example, if I click on this roof button, it will take me into a dialog box that allows me to change that. So if I only wanted it to be a four and 12 roof, I can select that and click okay. And then that will update. Um, the door, right now it's got a 30 inch, 36 inch um, steel door. 
Um, I'm going to want a different style of door for that. Um, I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to choose a 60 inch double French door. We're going to make this into more of a, um, a shed style that um, we can go into and we can have any style of door that you wanted to. So if you wanted to have a face slider door or sliding glass doors, pocket door, hinged, anything that you need or want will be in a different door style here that you can choose. So I'm going to select that. The windows that it's putting in is a two foot by a two foot fixed window. I'm going to want those to be operable. So I'm going to click on window. It takes me back into my catalog of window styles now. And as I scroll through the list, I can change that. So I'm going to say that I still only want it two feet wide, but I want it to be four feet long on both sides. And I click OK. Now I've described the shed in both its size, its construction method, where the doors and windows are, and the elements to build that. I'm going to click Next. Here it'll show you that you'll have a 2D appearance of a floor plan, and it's going to be a 3D model. At this point, we're done describing the shed, and when I click Finish, it's going to attach to my cursor so I can place it on my drawing screen. If I want to re-verify any of my options that I've selected, I can simply click Back, and that'll take me back through those dialog boxes where I can change any of the options that I want to. I'm happy with the selections that I made, so I simply click Finish. All I have to do is left click anywhere on my drawing screen and the shed will appear, matching the description that I created. Down here at the bottom of the dialog box, we have a zoom window tool. I want to make this bigger on my screen. So I left click on the zoom window tool. You'll notice that my cursor changes into a magnifying glass. It lets me know through the cursor change that I'm in a zoom tool. All I have to do is hold down my left mouse button and draw a box. As I hold down my left mouse button, you can see that blue box forming. What's inside that blue box is going to magnify on my screen. What's outside of it is going to be moved out. So you can see it nice and big on my screen right now. And my cursor has changed to an arrow. When your cursor is an arrow, it allows you to select things and change them if you want to. So if I left click on one of these walls, see as I get my cursor close to it, it tells me my cursor is on a two by four wood siding wall on the ground floor. If I left click to select it, you can see that the wall turns green. It lets me know visually green means it's selected. It also automatically puts up its dimensions. I can see that this shed is 10 by 15, the dimensions that I used in that dialog box. If I want to change any of those dimensions, I can click on the dimension itself. So I'm going to click on this 10 foot dimension. See again the cursor change? In Envisioneer, we always try to prompt you through cursor changes about what you're about to do. When your cursor changes to that hand, that means you're hovering over a dimension. And by left clicking, it'll bring you into a dialog box that allows you to change that dimension. The wall that is highlighted, that green wall, is the wall that is going to move when I change this dimension. So if I change this dimension to be 12 feet, this green wall will move out two feet in this direction. If I change it to nine feet, it'll pull this wall in to be nine foot instead for that dimension. So always remember that the wall that is highlighted is the wall that is going to move when you change any dim dimensions. So I'm going to change this to be 12 feet and click OK. You can see that that wall moves out now and the roof automatically moved with it. So we've got that gable roof over top of the entire shed. If I click on this dimension, the 15 foot dimension, you notice that the dialog box is a little bit different. The wall that is highlighted can't move if I'm changing this up or down dimension. So now we have arrows. So if I change this dimension to read 12 foot as well, 
what it wants to know is if I'm removing three feet of the shed, is that happening from the upper corner, the up arrow, or is that happening from the down arrow? Is this wall going to move up? So you can pick the arrow and then click OK. And you can see now that I have a 12 by 12 shed instead. So by clicking on these dimensions, you can go through and change any of the values that you need to when building your shed and updating it to customize it. So although it gives you the items automatically, they're very much so customizable to any size that you need them to be. In this floor plan view, we can also see that it put in our two windows and our door for us as well. If I move my cursor near one of them, you'll notice that the tooltip comes up at this point and tells me what I'm hovering over, the two foot by four foot casement window. If I left click on that window, dimensions will also appear. So I can move that window as I need to, just as I moved the walls. All you have to do is move your cursor over top of the dimension and change it. So if I want this window to move down closer to the front, I could change this three foot six dimension to be six feet. I want it six feet from the back and click OK. And that automatically moves it for me. So anytime you want to move an element, you simply put your cursor over top of it, wait for the tooltip to tell you that you're actually on that element, and then left click. And then it automatically pops up those dimensions and allows you to move them. With our shed that it created, it automatically gave us our windows, our walls, and our doors, and a roof over top of it as well. At any time, we can go out and look at this plan view as a 3D model instead. To do that, looking down here in the lower left-hand corner of our screen, we see 3D camera. That will automatically put in 3D cameras in a perspective view to take a look at our model. Next door to that, you'll see another tool that has 3D quick views. This tool allows us to look at our model from different vantage points, from the lower left, from the lower right, straight on front, from the right, from the upper right, the back, and the upper left as well. So you just pick on the arrow where you want to look at the shed from, and it automatically pops up a 3D view of that shed for you. So here we can see our shed that we built just by going through that wizard. Creates it automatically for us so it becomes very easy. In this type of view, we can take a look at our model in many different ways. So right now we're taking a look at our 3D shed and we can see all of the materials that are involved with it. We can see, <clears throat> excuse me, the wood siding, the asphalt shingles on the roof, our doors and our windows. Down here at the bottom of the screen, I'm hovered over a little tool that's called Rendered. If I click on the arrow beside it, I can put it into different views. One of them is called Realistic. What Realistic does is it casts down shades and shadows to show you that shed at a certain time of day. So you can see how it's going to cast down shadows around the shed and even inside the shed through the um, doors that are there. Another type of view is a hatch pattern view. So if you're looking for a view to illustrate the shed and you want to put that on your working drawings and show that it's siding and asphalt shingles, you can also have a very simple hatched view. You can also have a rendered outline view. So again, the rendered view with lines around everything. We've shown the rendered view. We also have a hidden line view. So if you just want a 3D model type of view, more for concept planning, you can go into this type of view as well. And there's also the wireframe that shows you every line that's involved in creating this so you can see the walls going up and the front and the back for that gable and all of the lines that are created. I'm going to put this back into our realistic view. When we're looking at this shed, the shed has much more information behind it than just looking at the sided walls and the roof over top of it. 
in their finished materials. I'm going to go up to the View pull-down menu up here at the top of the screen. You'll see View, and then you'll see Framing. So I can say Display the Framing. What this will do when I pick on this tool is it'll strip away all of the finished materials associated with the shed and just show the framing. So I'm going to choose Display Framing. Now we get to see that that shed has framing information behind it. We can see all of the studs. There's blocking halfway up. There's bottom plates and top plates. And we can see roof rafters and ridge boards going through. How did it get all of that information? How do I know how it framed, especially if this isn't necessarily how I would frame it in my local um, location? I'm going to go back up here to View, Framing, display all but the framing, so we can understand the information that lies beneath this model and where it got that framing information. I'm going to select one of the walls, just like we did when we were in 2D. It highlights green. We don't see the dimensions in 3D. That's something that's left in 2D. But we can see that we've selected the wall. Every time you left click to select something, you can then use your right mouse button and right click to bring up a variety of options that you can do to the selected item. We can view its properties, we can delete it, we can cut it out and copy it to another page, we can put it into a group of elements that we want to insert together all the time, we can even generate an estimate, and we'll get into that later too. We can move it, rotate it, duplicate it, elevate it, put it on an entirely different location, if this is going to be on the second floor too, mirror, replace it with another material. So if this one wall was going to be brick construction or stone, you could change the material. Or you can even match the appearances. So you can see there's a variety of things we can do to this wall. What we want to do is look at the background properties, how it knew to put that siding on, and how to frame that wall in that way. Let's look at the properties. So once I selected that wall and right-clicked and selected properties, it brings up the dialog box about that one wall. That one wall we can see has a type. It's a framed wall type. So it knew that automatically it would put framing to it. If you didn't want the walls to frame, you could set it to general. People generally do that when they're doing a renovation project. New walls are framed, existing walls are not, so they're not included in a material list. But when we look at the properties underneath this wall, we can see how it's drawn and how it is framed. So right now it's saying the core width of the wall is three and a half inches wide. So when it goes to draw that wall in 2D, it's going to put down two lines three and a half inches apart to represent the core of the wall. The core of the wall is the stud portions of the wall. Or if this was a concrete block or a concrete wall, that would be the, that portion as well. Whatever the structural portion of the wall is, is the core width. So in our case, it's three and a half inches because it's using a two by four. Then that wall is also has a width of three, three quarters of an inch on the outside. So right here, three quarters of an inch to the outside of that shows the width of the exterior surface. It's away from the wall a half an inch because of this air space. So three quarters inches apart are two lines that represent the exterior surface. They're a half inch away from the stud wall. That's how it's going to illustrate the wall here in 2D. It also has this framing member. It knows to use a two by four, and that's why we have that three and a half inches there. So what it does is it tells the wall, you're gonna frame this wall and you're gonna frame it with two by fours. So you've got your studs coming down, you've got your bottom plate, you've got your top plate. It had blocking in between the studs. All of those as a default are gonna be by two by four. We can tell it's something different and I'll show you that in a minute as well. But that's how it knew if I'm going to frame this wall, what to use for the framing. I'm gonna erase all of those out. Also here in this dialog box, we can associate the top and bottom, the height of the wall. You'll notice that the height of our wall on the wall top is set to automatically extend. That means when I'm drawing this wall, it will automatically extend up to the roof and go directly underneath it. 
which is perfect for our gable wall here, or the other walls that are along the fascia edge as well. If we didn't want it to auto extend, we can put a very distinct height to these walls as well. Right now, they're seven foot one and five eighths of an inch. If we wanted them to be nine foot walls or only four foot tall, we can tell them a very specific height. Or if they're sloped, or if they're stepped. So these walls can have any distinct shape that you need them to have as well for the height of the wall or automatically extend and find the roof and frame to it. The bottom of the wall can also slope down or step down. So if this shed or a house that you're building steps down, um, perhaps on a sloped lot with a walkout basement, you can achieve that here as well. You can also put trim on the walls. Take a look inside the window. When you're looking in the window, see the trim? They've got baseboard all the way around the walls here. And you'll also notice that we have a sill automatically placed on the door and on the window bottoms. That's done here under the trim tab. So the walls automatically get trim. The baseboard is five inch MDF baseboard. You can see the sills coming in through here as well. The walls themselves can also have um, <clears throat> trim on the outside face. So that's on the interior. And on the outside face, that's where we see that sill that's being put on both the doors and the windows. <clears throat> if we wanted to trim around the doors and, and uh, windows, we could put an opening trim casing around them. To do that, you just select what you want to put it around and then hit the select button. It takes you into a catalog of all different types of trim. So if I scroll down, I can see exterior trim, one by four PVC trim. That will be added to this one wall that I've selected. I don't have this wall selected, so it's not going to add it automatically to the window, but it will put it around the door for us. <clears throat> the appearance tab deals with when I'm looking at the model in 3D, what does it look like? What are the materials that are there for the asphalt shingles and the siding? <clears throat> when I'm looking at the wall, here's the exterior exterior surface. This is the material that it's using, this wood siding. These materials are simply JPEGs or bitmaps. That opens up the opportunity for you to look anywhere out on the internet or by taking your own digital picture of adding in a finish. So if you went up to a specific building manufacturer's website and downloaded their siding or their brick or their finishes for the exterior, you could bring in their JPEGs in here to represent that and it will apply it to the walls. Or if I pick on the roof, it could pick it and apply it to the roof. All the materials are JPEGs. That's a fantastic way as well as using your own digital camera, taking a picture of an existing finish on a house that you see or on a shed and then masking that on to the walls here so they have the same finish. So each component of this wall, the exterior surface, the inside face, I've got a paint color, the openings, and then the 2D core will also have a color associated to it. This appearance tab is about looking at the model in 3D and what materials appearance do they have. The line work tab deals with looking at the model in 2D. So when we were looking at that 2D floor plan, each component, each line has, can have a separate color, line type, and line weight associated to it. So when you go to print it out, if you want your exterior wall lines to be heavier than the interior wall lines, they can, that can happen because of the <clears throat> colors and line weights and line types that you're associating to each of the 2D components of that wall as well. The last tab that you can see here is quantity. When we're looking at the materials involved in building this shed, each one of them are assembled here under the quantity tab. So when I go to build this wall, I'm going to need wood siding and siding nails. I'm going to need house wrap and sheathing tape and OSB sheathing, nails and staples to staple that house wrap onto the sheathing 
that OSB sheathing that we're using. On the inside, we got kind of fancy with our shed and we even drywalled it. So we've got drywall and joint tape and joint compound and screws all to put in that drywall within there. So when we're done designing this shed, we'll get a quantity of how many sheets of drywall we're going to need, how many buckets of joint com compound we're going to need, and how many pounds of drywall screws we're going to require. Just by simply building that simple shed, it's automatically calculating all of these in the background because we've assembled all of these materials. Even bad insulation. This is going to be quite the cool hangout if we drywalled it and insulated. You could sit out there in any kind of weather. And the framing nails and even paint and primer. Because this is a true BIM model and it has height and width associated to all of those walls, it knows exactly to use what measurements to associate to give me the drywall, to give me the paint. So it can associate that automatically. So you can get a bill of materials, know exactly what you need to build the shed and put a cost to it as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit cancel there, but so that's the information that's behind those walls. It's using that two by four to frame it. If we look at the roof as an example as well, just by left clicking on it here in 3D, it selects it. And then I can right click and look at its properties. Here it's telling us that it's using a four in 12 slope. I know I have viewers around the world today in our webinar. So for those of you that don't use the question mark in 12, but instead you're using degrees or percentage, you can still do that. I'm using the model example today in feet and inches, but it's also available in metric and in degrees and percentage as well. So you can always find that perfect slope that you need that to be. This also has an appearance tab. I can pick the JPEG that I want to represent for the roof surface, for my fascia, my gable ends. So if it was going to build a gable end in there for me, it could put it in a separate material, my soffit material, and the underside of the roof. So if I'm looking up and there's no ceiling, I'm going to see plywood sheets. Also, when I'm looking at it in 2D for our working drawings, the roof surface, the 2D plan of it all has a color, line type, and line weight associated to it. And quantity material. So it's assembling all of these materials, asphalt shingles, ridge cap, shingle starter, nails, sheathing, stick nails, clips, felt paper, drip edge, flashing, ice and water shield, vent, everything that you need to create that roof. So once you have those rafters down and you put on your sheathing, and then you're going to put on your felt paper and your valley flashing and your ice and water shield, and then you're gonna put on your shingles, all of that is here. Also with all of the different fasteners that you're going to need for that as well, the clips and the nails and the roofing nails that you're going to need for that, all assembled here as well. When it goes to frame this roof, I'm gonna come back here under that basic tab, if you'll remember, when we looked at the roof, it had rafters placed out. It got the information about how to place out those rafters here under Specify Framing. If I click on the Specify Framing button, it tells me that, yes, I want you to put in some rafters, and I want them to be 2 by 8s and I want you to label them as a rafter with roof framing materials. These two items here, the um, usage and the phase, these are used for organizing the materials that you're going to use for the shed into groups. So that when you look at a material list at the very end, you don't just see that I've got a bunch of two by eights, well, what are they used for? They're labeled as rafters and they're put in a group called roof framing. So you can very quickly find all of the materials you need for the walls, for the roof, for the floor, because they're labeled correctly here. So these are just labels that we're going to be putting through. When it does, if I put a hole in the roof, it'll put a header through. So if you wanted to put a skylight in, or you were going to put a dormer in, you wanna get this a little fancier, you can cut a hole in the roof for those different items and they will automatically put a header around it. We'll get fancy with ours later. I'll show you how to add in all those different items. The fascia material, 
So when it goes and puts the fascia board down, what is that board? Well, it's a two by six, and it's gonna be labeled as subfascia with our framing, roof framing items. The ridge along the top is going to be a two by 10. It's going to be labeled as a ridge beam. If there was any hip boards, if we had any hip connections, they would be a two by 10 as well. Um, and then we would also have, let me scroll down here, valley boards, there isn't any valleys in ours, but those would be two by 10s. Gable boards are two by sixes, so up along the gables here are two by sixes. We also have at the bottom here, um, ladder framing along the gables. So for those of you that may not have um, know what ga uh, gable ladder framing is, so we've got our gable board coming on the back here, and then we have our first rafter. Usually what they do for that connection is, and then we've got our fascia board down here. They'll put a series of boards coming up along here until they get to that ridge board that comes all the way through. And this just gives it a more, more connection and better stability at the gables. So that's our gable ladder framing in there because it looks like a ladder. Right now we don't have it specified, but we can. So I'm going to say, yes, I do want ladder framing. But what member is it using? Right now it's saying nothing selected. You see we have two by six, two by 10, two by 10. If you click on all of those, you'll see this little button that allows you to change what it is. That's the same for this one that's none selected. That little button appears too, so I can select it. And then it brings me into my catalog of all different metal uh, members. I wouldn't want a steel beam, but maybe you do. <laughs> I can choose a two by six member, which would be appropriate for gable framing. And I click okay. When I put it in, I'm gonna put it right back to the structure. Or you can say that it can be a fixed width as well and give it a very a length that you want to associate to it. So if you didn't want to just come back to the first board and you wanted to extend that back further, that's when you would use a fixed width. But I'm going to say to structure so it goes back to my very first rafter in there. Usage. What is this and how should we label it in our list? Well, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to say that it's cable framing. And the phase. When I see this in the list, I want it to be with all the other roof framing materials. So I select roof framing. What's the spacing? So when I'm looking at the, the boards, what is the distance between one board and the next? So as I'm going through, what is the spacing between those? That's our spacing right here. So I'm going to put in that, that I want them 16 or 16 or 12 inches on center would be appropriate as well. It takes all of that information to frame the roof. So it'll automatically frame it giving those members. So when I click OK and I go to View, Framing, Display Framing, see how we've got our gable ladder framing happening all the way through there? It followed the rules and what I told it to do and automatically put them in. There's our 2 by 10 ridge. There's our 2 by 8 rafters are two by six for the gable ladder framing. All of that automatically got put through. But what about the walls? The walls dialog box didn't have a wall framing dialog box to it. How did it know to space out the studs, put in this blocking halfway up, put the bottom plate and top plates in? I'm gonna come up here to the top of the dialog box, the top of our screen, and go to the settings pull down menu. Under the settings pull down menu, we have something called building locations. I'm going to select that. This building locations dialog box lays out how many floors are in the building that we're going to do. So right now we have a foundation. We could have a full foundation underneath this. We've got a ground floor, a second floor. We can have 999 stories here. Good luck. Have fun. Create it. You can have as many locations doesn't mean you have to use them either. I'm not going to be using my second floor in the shed. We could. We could build a second floor, make it a little bunky in the top. But each one of these locations that are listed here also pre-programs the height of those walls going through. So if I was to draw walls on my ground floor location, they would come in at eight feet as a default. Because we use that shed wizard, that shed wizard had a height in there as well. So we matched its height but any further walls that I put in would automatically go in at eight feet. 
any windows or doors that are hung on the walls, so we have those openings here, they're automatically hung six foot eight off the floor, which is your standard window and door height. The wall heights here are eight foot one and an eighth. Why isn't the wall height eight feet? If you've never been taught that before in a class, walls are eight foot one and an eighth. Here, I'll just put in the wall top to bottom here. So that's from the top plate to the bottom plate of the wall. That's eight foot one and one eighth, standard height of a wall. The reason that that's one eighth of an inch taller is because drywall comes in at a standard height of eight feet. So if you tried to bring a sheet of drywall into a house and it, the wall heights were eight feet and the drywall was eight feet, it wouldn't fit. It would be such a snug fit. So walls for that matter are always made eight foot one and an eighth, an eighth inch gap at the top or at the bottom. Usually snag it up to right to the top and leave that little distance at the bottom, that eighth of an inch, so they can fit the drywall in. So just a fun fact for you today if you've never been taught that in a class before. When we go and look to the right of that, you can see that there's framing options as well. So when I draw a wall on this ground floor location, I know it's gonna be eight foot one and an eighth tall, but what are the framing options? How is it going to frame those walls? Right here, we can see the framing infill. It tells us 16 inches on center. That means that the studs are going to be 16 inches apart from center line of the wall stud to the center line of the wall stud. And it's going to have a double top plate. So there's two plates up here. And there's only one single bottom plate. And it says blocked. So there's blocking halfway up there. That's that board right here. If you want to change that and, and have something different framed, all you have to do is click on that option. If you double click on it, it brings you into a catalog so you can show it how to frame it in an entirely different way. Since this is a shed and it's probably going to be resting on top of a concrete slab, you might want to have a pressure treated bottom plate. So this one, this option I'm highlighted on right now, will space the studs apart 12 inches, so they're only gonna be a foot apart. It's gonna have a double top plate and a two by four pressure treated bottom plate. 12 inches on center is probably overkill. So we would want it to be 16 inches on center, two by four pressure treated bottom plate and blocking halfway up. For the blocking halfway up, depends on where you are in the world, some of you, depending where you are, if you're an Australian visitor today, you might refer to that blocking as nogging. So when we say blocking for you, for those of you in Australia, that's nogging, okay? Different terminology around the world. That blocking is a structural component of the wall that gives it stability. So when they're building it, some different regions don't require it. So you could just have 16 inches on center, double top plate, no blocking there at all. Or if you wanted to have the pressure treated uh, bottom plate, you could pick that option. That blocking can be different formats as well. Right now you can see that it's um, laying down there, just giving stability. But if you know you're going to be hanging things up in this shed, so maybe you're going to have a wall full of rakes and, and different things, you could have lots of blocking there. So I'm just gonna double click on this option to bring up how this framing configuration is built. So we can see here that we've got our bottom plate, it's a two by six treated board. We've got our studs. They're looking at the wall's property to use the member. Remember our wall said it was a two by four? So when it goes to put studs in, it's going to use that two by four. The top plate is also going to use that wall member, the two by four and the very top plate as well. Then we have blocking here, and there's nothing here right now because this one doesn't have blocking. We're making something new. So I'm gonna hit new. See how this green line automatically goes through? That's our nogging or blocking there. These are all the information about it. So the initial offset there is four feet. We could make that two feet and then say that every two feet up that wall, we want blocking. So this, Positioning and this placement is saying, where is it in that wall? 
Well, I'm saying initially off the bottom plate, it's two feet up, and then every two feet from there. So I've got that wall framing right there. So if I wanted to put in some um, different holders for rakes and shovels or whatever I want to store in there, if I know I'm going to be putting in nails in there to hold that stuff up, I'm going to want some blocking in there so that it can take that nail and it can take that weight. Otherwise, when you go to put a nail in and hang something up, you could be right here, right in between those two studs. And ultimately, it's going to fall down because there's nothing really holding it up. So when we put those that blocking in, if it's on that blocking, then it's going to have more stability. So that's why we would put it in. Okay, so you can um, change the framing of a wall to put in as much backing, as much blocking as you need to. I'm just going to cancel out of there and we'll accept that framing right there. So how, that's how it knows how to frame that wall and get its wall information from there. Anytime I punch a hole in that wall for a door or a window, it's gonna be looking at these span tables too. These span tables, if I double click on them, bring up information about the spans. So anything up to a three foot opening, so that window that we put in that's only two feet wide, it's just gonna have two two by four headers sitting above it. That's the header right here. So if I can label these out for those of you unfamiliar with the terminology, that's our header piece. And it's just going to be uh, two two by fours there. Then we've got the sill plate in there on the bottom of the sill of the window. And at the side, we're going to have jack studs and king studs. If that's a new terminology for you, I'll show you how those are um, created as well. I'm just going to erase all of that out and I'm going to click on this button here to take me back to look at a configuration. So I'm just going to double click on one of them. When we punch a hole in a, in a door in a, for a door or a window in a wall, it has to know how to frame around it. So it looks here at this head sill configuration. Over here to the far right, we've got this preview and it's going to highlight. That's going to help you to learn this terminology. That's a king stud that it's highlighting. If I click on a jack stud, that's a jack stud that it's highlighting. You can see their position. That's on the right, and there's also jacks and kings on the left as well. And then we have our header board above, and we have our sill board below the opening. The studs that are above and below the um, opening are called cripples. So you can have cripples and define how they're put in as well. So each of these can have a board, two by four, or look at how the wall properties are two by four for our wall and use that for the jacks and the kings. So when you very specifically want to frame an opening a certain way, you can come right in here and tell it exactly how to frame it. We've got lots of videos on this um, to how to frame and get into the specifics there. I don't want to spend way too much time and confuse you, but I just wanted to point out jacks and kings and headers and how it gets that information for this sh simple shed that we're building. So I'm going to back out all the way out of here and click OK. You can see that I put my pressure treated board along the bottom there when I changed that and it removed the blocking of the wall or knocking depending on where you are. So that's how it gets all the framing information. So if I come back here to view, framing, display all the, but the framing, we get our finished materials as well. Okay, so all of that information just from that one simple shed drawing that we put in. I'm gonna put it back into 2D. Now let's start playing with this shed and adding some new information to it. We've got our simple shed that is now 10 by 12. We might want to add in a little bump out to one side of it, or we might want to put in a different slope on that roof. There's lots of different changes that we can make. If I want to add another wall into this shed, I can click on this tool right here. This is the walls tool. When I click on the walls tool, the catalog panel that you can see on the right of my screen, if you can't see the right of my screen, the GoToMeeting console is blocking that. There should be a little arrow that you can push that minimizes the go to meeting screen so you can see this catalog. To the right over there, it shows us all different types of walls that we can build with. I'm going to choose the two by four wood siding wall, the same wall that we've already 
been using um, for our shed thus far. All I have to do is move my cursor out onto the drawing screen. Notice the cursor change again. Now my cursor looks like three interconnected walls. It's ready to start drawing walls wherever I tell it that I want them to be. I'm going to put my cursor on top of one of these walls. See how dimensions automatically appear? It's showing me how far my cursor away is from the corners of this wall. So as I move my cursor, those dimensions are going to change. If I want to be an exact distance away from the corner, I've got right click options. So left click is always to insert something. Right click gives me options on how to insert it or properties of something I've already selected. So here I see an option, enter insertion offset. An insertion offset is a distance away from a corner that I want to start building this wall. So I'm going to click on that option. I want this new wall to be two feet away from that top corner. So I type two feet. Now watch as I move my cursor. Any wall that I get close to, it's going to show me how to be two feet away from that wall corner that I'm close to. I want this wall corner here. So as soon as I see that two foot dimension, I don't have to move my cursor onto that extension line. As soon as I see it, I can left click and my mouse will automatically going to jump to that point. So I left click and my cursor automatically goes down there. Now I'm starting to draw a wall. See as I move my cursor, that wall is showing its dimension. As I move it out, I can watch those dimensions and left click if I see the dimension that I like. If I want again a precise dimension, I'm going to um, put your attention to the bottom of my screen where you see distance and direction. As I'm pulling my cursor out, see how that distance changes as well? And I'm moving my cursor in the zero direction to the right of my screen. If I move my cursor up, see how the direction changes to 90 degrees? 90 degrees is at the top of my screen. If I pull it to the left, the direction is 180. And if I pull it to the bottom, direction is 270. So as I pull to the right, that zero direction, the distance box is active, meaning I can type something without moving my cursor down there. So if I simply type five feet, see how it automatically types it there? And then I hit the tab key to the direction. See how it now becomes active? It's got the blue around it. I could type any direction. So if I wanted to go out at an angle of 45 or 30, I could type that direction too. If I am happy with five feet in the zero direction, I simply hit enter and it drew a five foot wall in the zero direction. Now I move my cursor down. And as I move my cursor down, I can again type a dimension. I'm going to type seven feet. Hit the tab, it's going in that 270 direction down towards the bottom of my screen. And I hit enter. And it just drew a seven foot wall. Now I bring my cursor back to the wall. And as I bring my cursor back to that initial wall, I can accept the five foot dimension or look at my cursor. It looks like a circle with an X. A circle with an X means it's snapping to that wall. And because it's snapping to that wall, it'll automatically create a nice connection for me. So I'm simply going to left click and it automatically builds that little bump out for me. You'll notice the roof didn't automatically go over top of it. The roof knows to stay here until I tell it something different. I'm going to right click and choose finish. For the roof over this little bump out area, I can do one of three things. One, I can take this roof and delete it and put a root new roof on. And a new roof will automatically find the exterior walls. It'll come down like this. Notice this is exterior, come over here, follow this line all the way around the exterior shell and build a roof around it. So I could just delete that and put that on. Or I can take what's already there and edit it to stretch it out to this point as well. So if I want it overhang over here and overhang over here, see that little blue square? That's called a grip. At the end of that green arrow, there's a blue 
square that's called a grip. Watch as I move my cursor over top of that grip. See how my cursor changes? That's called a move arrow. It's letting me know that I'm allowed to pick up and move that support point of that roof where it's bearing down on those walls right now and move it to another point. So if I hold down my left mouse button and don't let it go, I can bring it over here now and release. And that simply brings the whole roof over that structure. It's bearing down on this one right here and it's just overhanging that entire distance. If we go back down to our 3D tool here and I look from the lower right, you can see what it's doing. It's just incorporating the entire roof underneath this area. See this little tool right here that I'm hovered on? I'm just gonna move my cursor to draw your attention there. It's called the fly around tool. If I click it and hold my mouse button down, it allows me to move around my model to see exactly what it looks like. So I can see the roof going in that area. And if we tilt it up, there's our soffit going through and it knows it's only got a 12 inch soffit. So then I get to expose roof too. So we can see that bump out being covered by the roof that we just dragged over there. And put it back into 2D. I'm going to come up here to edit undo to bring it back in line and supporting on this one. The other thing that I can do for this, this roof in this area is I can build a new roof over this area right here. I know that this is a 4 and 12 hip roof. If I go up to the roof tool, and that's this tool right here, I can do a roof by perimeter, and that's that yellow line I just a couple steps ago showed you. It would find that perimeter and put an entirely new roof over top. Or I can say roof by picking points. Just pick points around a certain area to build a roof. I only need a roof in this area right here. So I could pick points on these corners to say these are the corners of the roof that I need. Just build a roof over this area. So if I do that, roof by picking points, I could come over to my catalog panel, choose my 412, and then pick those points. Bear the roof here, left click, bear the roof here, left click, bear the roof here, left click, and bear the roof here, left click. And then right click and tell it I'm finished. It automatically combines the two roofs together and build a roof out just in that area for me. On the point that I picked to show where the corners of the roof are going to be and where they bear, it built a roof by picking points, recognized the roof already existing here, and combined them together. So now we can take advantage of that little bump out area. I'm going to remove this window. I left click to select it, and then I right click and choose delete, remove that window. I can also tell it to remove this portion of the wall between those two yellow points, between those two new walls. I can left click to select it and then right click and say delete. And that will remove that portion of the wall. So now if this is the new shape of my shed. So you've got lots of different options there. And in this one right here, perhaps in this area, this is where we want a window. So I pick on the window tool. Over to the right, I'm gonna put in a three foot six by five foot double casement window. Just by selecting it, left clicking on it in my catalog, I pick that window. I move my cursor out onto the drawing screen. Look at my cursor. It now looks like a window. It's telling me I'm about to insert a window. So I can insert that window on this wall. Okay, see how my cursor automatically puts it in and I've got those dimensions? Remember with the wall, we wanted it a certain distance away from the corner? We can do the same thing for the window. I can right click to reveal the options I have for insertion and say, enter an insertion offset a set distance away from a corner or center it on this wall. So I'm gonna say center it on this wall. So it'll automatically find that center point two foot, two foot away from that corner, I left click and it puts it in. I right click and I tell it I'm finished. I don't need any more windows. Okay, 
Now let's take a look inside our shed. See what it looks like inside. Right down here, we had that 3D button. And I showed you that it could do a perspective view. From the outside corner, looking from an angle, it automatically has a camera set up for that. But you can put in any camera view that you want by choosing Place New Camera. And then it tells, lets you decide where you're standing. I'll stand right inside my door, right inside those French doors. I left click to say that's where I'm standing. And then it says, where do you want to look? And you get this arrow. I want to look up to this corner and I left click. Instantly, it brings me in to my shed. Remember that fly around tool that allowed us to fly around the exterior of the model? Right beside it, we have the look around tool. This look around tool allows us to look around. So now I can look around the model. Looking around a model is a great idea, not just to visualize the space. I mean, we can see our unfinished uh, shed roof on the inside. We see our drywall, but we also can detect issues. We expanded the walls out to this area and told the roof to expand out over that area. But we didn't do that for the floor. The six inch concrete floor that it originally put in when we built this shed is still back here. If I want to expand it out, I can delete it and put in a new one or stretch it out just like we did with the roof. You've got all of those options. I'm gonna hit right click and hit delete to show you how you put in a brand new one. Going up here to our floors tool, this puts in a floor by room. It'll recognize one entire room, which this is, and put a floor into that entire area. Or to look at the perimeter of your walls, the exterior perimeter, and match that sh same shape as well. For room and by perimeter are the same for us. We don't have any interior walls making separate rooms, so it would be the same. Or we could pick points, just like we did when we were putting the roof by picking points in. We can show it all the corners by picking points as well. And then we have room division if we want to divide it up later. We won't cover that today. So this would be a floor slab that you're pouring or it could be a finished floor that you're putting in. So if we put in our floor slab or concrete, it automatically went in, and then we could put in a floor finish on top of it, tile, hardwood, whatever you wanted to. So that's our floor tool. Right next door to that is our structural floor tool. What this tool does is it builds floor joists, subfloor, sill plate. So if we were going to frame a floor, we would use our structural floor tool. So we would get all the floor joists put in instead of a slab. Either one, depending on how you're building that floor out, you would use either tool. You can see that they all have the same options by perimeter, by room, or by picking points. We're just going to pour a flat slab today. So I'm gonna choose floor by perimeter. The catalog panel to the right will update and show me all the different types of floors that I have. I'm going to choose the four inch concrete floor, but you can see that you have different finished materials as well. I move my cursor inside and I just left click once. It searches out the perimeter walls and automatically pours the new concrete floor for us. So now I have a floor in that area. Okay, so you can see the floor throughout it. Now, what about a ceiling? Do we want to keep the plywood ceiling? This is just a shed, but it's looking more like a personal use that you would go in here and hang out. So what if we put a ceiling inside this space as well? I'm going to put us back into a 2D view. So that's this 2D blue button. Bring us back into 2D. We have another form of 2D view called the 2D designer's view. The 2D designer's view, if I click on it, is a top-down look at our model showing all the finished materials as well. So right now we're top-down looking at the roof. I can strip away different parts of our model so we can look past the roof and into the floor plan. Down at the bottom of the screen, I'm going to direct your eyes down now, we have this tool called the View Filter. If I click on the View Filter tool, it allows me to filter out different elements that I don't want to see. So you can see it 
noted all of the different elements that we've put in so far. We've got a floor, we've got a roof, and we've got tags. That's You'll see the little uh, windows all had numbers beside them. That's their tags. And we have walls. If I had also inserted stairs and railings and columns and footings, those would also be in here as well. So as we add more and more elements, this view filter list gets bigger and bigger as well. Beside the names of each of the different types of elements, we also have display, and you can see the eyes are open. But I can close an eye just by clicking on it. I don't want to see the roof right now. I'm going to close that eye. And when I close an eye and click OK, it disappears. It's still part of our model, we just can't see it right now. It's still going to quantify. I can still get drawings from it if I turn it back on, but right now it's turned off. So we can see in this 2D designer's view, the finished concrete floor and the finish of our walls. But I wanna put a ceiling on. So I'm going to choose the ceiling tool, which is right next door to our floor tool. Here in the ceilings tool, we have the same options. Ceiling by room, each room can have a separate ceiling. Ceiling by the entire perimeter of your exterior walls, or you can also pick points, just like we did when we extended out the roof over that area. I'm gonna use ceiling by room. This is one big room, I want one big ceiling in it. So I choose ceiling. Now look over in your catalog panel to the right. Here we have unframed ceiling, frame ceiling, suspended acoustical tile type ceiling, or a porch ceiling. So if we were gonna be using finished soffit material instead. So I'm going to use a two by six half inch drywall framed ceiling. So it's gonna put ceiling joists in our ceiling and then it's going to put in our half inch drywall ceiling. I move my cursor inside the room because I did ceiling by room and I left click. Now I can't see my floor because I have my ceiling there. This is an automatic tool, so it wants to keep doing more and more rooms. I right click and I tell it I'm finished. This is my only room. So now I have a ceiling in. So if I jump back into our camera one, now I can see the finished ceiling in here as well. Now we have the room and down at the bottom, remember our view types? I can change that to a realistic view. So now I can see if I use my look around tool, what it's going to look like with the shadows coming in through those windows and doors at certain times of day. I'm gonna put that back into 2D. So now we have our roof, our ceiling, our walls, our floors in. Now let's start to add elements to the inside. We're gonna need lights and switches. You might even wanna put in some furniture to dress this up as well. I'm gonna click on now the interiors tab. Underneath the interiors tab, we have cabinetry. So if you wanted to add in kitchen cabinets, countertops, appliances, if you wanted to put a stove or a fridge in there, there's electronics. So you can put some speakers or computer screens, anything you want in there, furniture, um, interior accessories, curtains on the walls, and electrical, and lighting, and plumbing, and HVAC. I'm gonna first start off putting in some lighting. In with the lighting, each one of these lights, you can see their 3D picture below. They also have a 2D representation and they also illuminate. So when we look back in 3D, we'll be able to see what it looks like with this light turned on. Because this is just a simple little shed and it's probably gonna be hot in there, we're not gonna put any HVAC in it. I'm gonna use a ceiling fan to um, cool us down. So we have different ceiling fans you can see here, some with lights, some with not with lights. So I'm just gonna move this in and place it right in the middle. Right click and tell it I'm finished. Maybe against this wall, I might want to put in some um, wall lights. So I'm gonna grab some sconces here, there's all different types, and I just place them against the wall. I'm gonna zoom in using our zoom window tool here just to illustrate this a little better. So I've got this sconce attached to my wall, my cursor. See as I move it in, if I move it up against this wall, watch what happens when I move it over against this wall. See how it automatically flips? It knows the back of that light needs to sit up against a wall, so it'll automatically turn for you. So anytime you drag it towards a wall, it will turn it in the right orientation for you as well. 
When you're done with your lights, you right click and you say finished. I'm just going to blow this up a little bit, use zoom window again to make this a little bigger on the screen for you again. Now that we have the lights in, now we have to know how to control those lights. So that's when we have our electrical elements and electrical wiring. And we can auto place outlets too. The electrical elements that we need to begin with are switches. So I'm going to put in a double switch plate. You can see the little 3D illustration here. I want a double switch plate as soon as I come in the double doors here. So I can turn on the fan and turn on the lights. Okay, I might want another one here. So when I'm in this room, if I need to turn either of them off, I might want to put one there as well. I right click and I tell it I'm finished. So in 2D, I can see the representation of these elements. And if I go into 3D, into our camera one view, I can see the ceiling fan. I can see the light that's being illuminated from it. I can see our switches. I can see our wall sconce. And if I turn all the way around, I can see the other switch here at the door. Now what I have to indicate to the electrician that's ultimately going to be doing a job for this is what switches affect which lights. And that's when we do a wiring diagram. So I'm going to pick on this switch right here and tell it that it goes to this light right here. And then from this light, it goes to this switch. And then I right click and choose repeat because I have this switch that ultimately goes to this light and this light and this switch. So I right click and hit finish. So that just shows them where the lights occur. I'm gonna click on this one. See how we can move it around? It's got that blue grip that we looked at earlier when we were moving things around. I can move this grip up so it comes inside as well. So we can show them a complete wiring diagram. So we have our lights. Now we need outlets. We wanna be able to plug things in. We want to be able to charge our phones and plug in uh, computers or TVs or whatever we want in the shed. So I'm going to choose Auto Place Outlets. With Auto Place Outlets, it wants to know what type of outlets you want. So first of all, I'm going to go here to um, Settings and Document Settings and go into our settings dealing with the Auto Place Outlets. So with the auto place outlets, what it's telling me is it's automatically going to place an element, uh, an outlet along every wall that's at least two feet long. And the maximum distance between outlets is 12 feet. So you could say that we want minimum is going to be 18 inches. The distance between the outlets is going to be 10 feet. And the maximum distance from an opening, maybe we want that to be four feet. And the outlet that we're using here is if I go to our outlets, I'm just going to use a duplex. Again, for those of you that are viewing us internationally, I know your outlets and your switches may look different. Um, we do have a metric um, international catalog as well that will show them correctly for you. I click OK and then apply and OK. And now when I use this auto place outlets and left click, it automatically places the outlets for me. Right click cancel. You can see all of the outlets going through all along. Okay, so we automatically get all of our outlets in two. I'm going to come up here to view, framing, display the framing. We can also see the framing in 2D. When I view the framing in 2D, notice also that every wall has a number and an arrow pointing to it. This is number one wall. This is number two wall. See the numbers? Those are pointing to the walls because each wall is framed separately. So each one of those walls has a wall framing diagram associated to it as well. So if I come up here to tools, wall panels, I can see every wall along here framed. There's our front wall, wall zero. You can see that it's the gable end wall the opening going over top of it. We've got our jacks, we've got our kings, we've got our header there. Wall number one has our opening, so we've got our header and our jacks and our kings. Wall number three is just a small framed wall, or two, sorry, is just this small framed wall here. Wall three at the back is our other gable. 
four, the small little wall as well, five, this wall right here, this is what it's, how it's going to be framed, six, with our big opening in it, and eight. So they'll create all of these different panels for you. And each one of these, um, you can come in and um, illustrate it just by double clicking on it. And then you can click on insert the panels. When I highlight all of these walls and hit insert the panels, watch the bottom of my screen. See how we get one, two, three. It's creating all of these panels for us as we're going through. So I can look and see all of those different panels down at the bottom. I hit close. So if I go to my zero sheet here at the, at the bottom of the screen, it gives me an illustration on how to build that wall and the material that it's going to need underneath it, the framing material. So I can see everything that's marked as an A is a two by four stud that's cut to seven foot six and three quarters of an inch. Because this is a gable wall, some of those studs are going to be at a different length, and you can see all the different lengths going through there. Then we've got our jack studs on either side of the opening, our header material, our plate material, and our treated plate at the bottom of the wall, and our cripple studs. So you can basically take this diagram and know the exact length to cut each one of these boards, and following it like a puzzle, build that wall and then go to the next panel, build that wall. Going to each one of these separate panel diagrams and building each one of these walls out. So you could build this shed. All from the model that we created here. As we were creating it, it was putting the framing information together and then it can spit it out into individual framing diagrams. By coming back up here to view framing, we can also choose display all but the framing. So we get our 2D illustration. So we've got our 3D model. We've got our 2D floor plan. We've got our wall framing diagrams. Now we have to start creating the working drawings that we would need to create this shed. The first stop on that is dimensions. We need dimensions around this shed. We know that when we click on a wall, the dimensions will appear but I want them to appear permanently. To get them to appear permanently, we come up here to the tools pull down menu. One of the tools that we have available is dimensions. One of the dimension tools that we have is auto exterior dimensions. When I click on auto exterior dimensions, dimensions will automatically throw themselves around the building so I can see them. I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit so we can see all the dimensions. That's a lot of dimensions. I don't need necessarily all of them because some of them are repeats. So I could, as an example, delete out this 15 foot dimension, delete. I already know that that's five foot and 10 foot. I could probably get rid of it on this side as well, just to make it a little bit smaller. I know that this is 12 feet, automatically delete. So I have all of my dimensions that I really need to build. Okay. Once I have all of those dimensions, now I can put them onto working drawing sh sheets. We've been building with the 3D model. So we've been looking at it in 3D views. We've been looking at it in 2D views. Now's the time to put it into 2D illustrations. That's when we start clicking on these sheets at the bottom that are automatically there. One floor plan. This takes me into 2D drafting tools where I can take a view of the 3D model that I built Translate it into a 2D drawing to print it out. We automatically have our title block here. That title block is updatable. If I click on the title block, by just left clicking on any line or string of text to select it, it brings up its properties over in the right hand side. So when we were working in the model view, we saw the catalog panel to the right. Now, as we select an item in the 2D portion of the software, we see the properties of the item that we select. So right now we can see that this is a block called a 24 by 36 inch title block. And that it has a definition of what the lines look like and it has attributes. What attributes are are strings of text that are attached to the model 
that are updatable. The definition are strings of text that are not, um, that you can update and change, but they don't change per sheet. The attributes change per sheet, the definitions don't. So if I edit the definition, you can see we've got the word CAD soft in there, just written in here. That's where you can change that and put in your school name. So my school, or I can type that all in capitals, better form, my school. And when I click OK, it becomes my school. So each one of these strings of text can be updated to your address or whatever you need it to be. When you're done, it is very important you hit the escape key. By hitting the escape key, it congeals it back into a block. So now we have that one block again. Every one of these sheets, one floor plan, two elevation, three details, four site plan at the bottom, will now be translated so that it says my school instead of CADSOFT. So you can make those changes. You can see that our logo is in there. That's part of the definition and you can update that too. To put information onto these sheets, we come up to this button right here, Smart Views. Define a Smart View. Define a view of my model that I have built and bring it in as a 2D illustration so I can print it out. Define Smart View. It brings up this Insert View dialog box where I tell it what type of view I want to create to insert onto my title block. So first of all, I have a 2D ground floor plan at a quarter inch scale of my model. What you see in this preview is exactly what it's going to bring in. This green line that it has around the corners is the extent of the grass out in my terrain. I don't necessarily need that for my for floor plan view. That's why we have this eye. It works the same as that view filter that I had showed you earlier. It allows me to filter out things that I do not need so I can only print out the things that I do need in my 2D ground floor plan. So I'm going to pick on the eye. Here in the eye, I can turn off the view filter things I don't need. I don't need to see my ceilings in a 2D view plan, floor plan view. I don't need to see the floors. I do want to see my electrical elements. It's a small plan. I can put them in um, that way. And my lighting. I don't need to see the roof. I do need to see my walls. I'm going to keep those on. Under elements on terrain, the separate tab up here, that's that terrain line, that green line that I just showed you. If we close the eye on it, it turns it off. Notation, if I didn't want the electrical wiring or the dimensions to be visible, I could turn those off as well. So depending on the view type that you're creating, you can turn those on and off. And then you simply click OK. And that plan updates. I'm going to zoom in on it. Zooming does not affect scale. Scale is determined here. So I could zoom in as much as I want to, and it's not going to change that scale. But what you see is what you get. So if I zoomed in so close and this is all I saw, that's what's going to be inserted. Your floor plan is going to be cut off. So make sure if you do zoom in, you make sure that you still see everything that you need to see. What you see is what you get. That's called WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Make sure you are viewing what you want to get. Down at the bottom of the screen, I can insert this as a drawing. So it knows that lines are lines and text is text or I can illustrate it and bring it in as an image. So it's like a JPEG. It's a raster image that we'd be bringing in. I want to bring it in as a drawing. So I hit insert. Copy of it attaches to my cursor. I left click, it's in. I have my floor plan. So here is my floor plan. Let's repeat that process and get our elevations in. Go back up to the smart views, define a smart view. These buttons up here at the top, these different tabs, allow you to create different types of view. This one with the green box and the black arrow coming out of it is our elevation views. So here is my front elevation at a quarter inch scale. What you see is what you get. So I'm going to want to zoom out here so I can see the bottom of those walls. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, we also have display mode. Remember with display mode, we could see something is realistic. 
I want to see those materials. I want to insert it as a hatch pattern view. I want to insert it as a rendered outline view. I want to insert it as a hidden line view. So depending on the view you want to insert, you change it there. We also have datum lines. And if that's a new term for you, datum lines, I'll just illustrate that for you as well. If you haven't taken this in school yet, when I insert this view, I can have lines automatically coming out at different points and dimensions appear. So this would be my floor level. This would be my, let's say the ceiling level. And this is the roof ridge level. So if I wanted dimensions coming up for each of those points, I can automatically put them in by saying, yes, include the datum line. I automatically want it for my ground floor. Yes. I want it for my uh, roof ridge. Let's say yes. And my ceiling height. Yes. Let's say yes. So whatever ones you need. And then for whatever location. I just want it for my ground floor location. And then all you have to do at that point, now that we have the type of drawing, it's a hidden line, quarter inch scale, front elevation. I'm inserting it as a drawing. I hit insert. And a copy of the elevation attaches to my cursor, and I left click to place it. So there's my datum lines automatically up the sides. You repeat this defined smart view for as many views as you need to insert. So I could come back to my elevation view, tell it that I want a right elevation view, zoom out, what you see is what you get, WYSIWYG and come through to my view filter. Maybe I don't want the terrain line on, turn it off. And maybe with that, I want this one to me perhaps in a rendered outline, perhaps I want it in a pattern view, whatever type of view you want, whatever datum lines you want to include, include it as a drawing, insert, and place it onto your drawing screen. When you have all the views that you want here on your drawing screen, you can start adding text as well. Tools, text, text. This is where I could type in the names of each of those views. So I'm going to say this is a, a heading style of text. And with the heading style of text, I'm going to want it to be left justified. I'm going to say um, floor plan. And I want that all to be underlined. When it inserts this floor plan, I'm going to put it underneath the floor plan view. And then the text command is done. But if I check here and say multiple text insert and click OK, when I left click to place in floor plan, the dialog box will pop right back up again. And then I can say front elevation and place that under my front elevation. And then I can type in right elevation uncheck it, click OK, and push in my right elevation. And I have them all labeled. So you can create those views, okay? And then um, print that out if that's all you needed. Or you can come back here to define a smart view, go into a 3D view, and I'm just gonna walk up to this 3D view here, and maybe you want a present presentation style. So I can say, put that into a realistic view and insert that as an image and place that image on here as well. So you can get different image views too. So you can create that full working drawing. But what if this image view isn't good enough? You want a high impact 3D view, perhaps even a, a virtual reality view to illustrate your drawings. Let me take you back to model view. We've got our model, we've got our working drawings, we've got our floor and our roof and our walls all framed, and we've done uh, wall panel diagrams so we know how to frame out each wall. Now we want to present this in a meaningful way. I'm going to go inside our view here and turn myself around. And perhaps this is a view that I want to show someone just to illustrate what this shed looks like from the inside. If I come up here to view, you can see we've got a couple different options here. Render 3D real view and render panoramic view. What render 3D real view does is it takes a look at the room 
and then you can create a rendering of it. So I'd say start rendering. When it starts rendering, it takes that view that I'm looking at through a process called radiosity and ray tracing. So it's looking at all the light sources that are in the room, the ceiling fan, the wall sconces, the light that's coming in from through the windows, and it gives it that realistic look of what that light would look like coming into the room. And then it looks at all the finishes that are in the room. Is it a glossy finish? Is it a dull finish? Is it a reflective surface? And then it makes those look even more realistic as well. So you can get a photorealistic rendering. So we're just doing a simple one off to the side of our screen right now. This is what we would call a level one rendering. So I'm just going to bring it up and then bring that down. You can see how you can play with the brightness and the gamma to make it look even more real. This is level one. You can get up to level five in the photorealism of them. So you get even more shades and shadows. It'll look even more photorealistic in all the materials that are in that space as well. Those can be saved. If I save those, I can save those as a JPEG or a bitmap it's for you to view. If I reset this and go into, I'm just gonna cancel there. If I reset that and go to options, this is where you can change that to up to the highest level. So it looks very photorealistic. And save those as a JPEG and a bitmap image. You can also instead create a rendered panoramic view. A rendered panoramic view looks at where you're standing in the room, where that camera's position is, and it'll automatically create 360 camera shots all the way around that camera view so that you can pan around the entire room and get that realistic look as well. We have saved some of those views up on our website. So if you go up to www.cadsoft.com, and I'm going to take you there right now, on our web page, we have at the bottom of the screen an image gallery. So going up to cadsoft.com, going to the image gallery, if I click on that image gallery, that'll take me into visuals that you can create. There's a gallery of the 3D60 panoramic views. These are illustrations of the type of um, views that you can create. So if I click on this one as an example, it'll bring up the 360 view. And just by holding down my left mouse button, I'm panning around that view. So I get a look about all the different angles of that room. So just clicking here, creating that view. Just got a slower internet connection. Excuse me while it tries to catch up. By creating that view, see how I'm panning around in that view. So here is, and this is just a beach house that was created, just a, you can create all of those materials. You can insert all of those lights. There's the cabinets. So everything that we touched on today, you can create your shed to look like this shed in a 360 view or create photorealistic renderings, and I'll take us into perhaps this one right here. So this is a JPEG or bitmap image that you created directly from the software, and this is the type of rendering quality that you're going to get. So you can see what it's going to look like. All from that 3D model that you created. So you've got the capabilities of bringing in materials, brick, the rug, You've got the ability to create the walls and the ceilings and the floors like we did in our shed today to create a fantastic shed that you can illustrate. I'm going to go back into the software and cancel out of the rendering. So not only are we building a 2D illustration, a floor plan view of the shed, we can also create the photorealistic images that you need for that. And you can also create the working drawings in the framing diagrams all from just starting off today, going to Shed Builder. Those would be great for the projects that you want to build at home this summer, or perhaps in a project that you have at school this fall. What I'd like to do now for the remaining portion, the last uh, moments of our class, is open up the chat panel where you can type in any questions. Today, we very lightly covered over all of the subjects, 
There are separate training videos. There are separate blog posts on building walls, putting in windows and doors, putting on a roof, putting in electrical diagrams, lighting, rendering, 360 views. If you'd like, I can send you all of those different links. All you have to do is chat with me in the chat panel to the right and let me know which ones are of interest to you. And then I can answer those for you and send you out all of those various documents. So at this point, does anyone have any questions today about any of the material we covered? We covered a plethora of material and I wanna make sure that if anyone has any questions about building a shed and using the basics of the software, um, I answered those for you. If you are an instructor watching today's class for your students, we do have classes tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday. Tomorrow's class, we dive in deeper about building a model. It's just not a shed, it's an entire house. And then on Wednesday, we produce working drawings about that house, going into more depth about sections and, and elevations and hatching and datum lines and all of those. And then on the Thursday, we, we talk about rendering and how you can get those photorealistic appearance for the different um, surfaces that you're creating as well. So if you are an instructor and if you haven't already registered for the class and you would like to register for the class, just shoot me an email and I'll be able to um, get you into those classes as well. I'm looking at our questions. There doesn't seem to be any in today's, um, but I will leave that open for one further moment. Just in case anyone does have a question, I'll be able to um, answer those for you. So I'm just going to leave that open for one further moment for anyone with any questions and then we'll be able to answer those for you here. If not, I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's webinars if you are registered and we will be sending out a recording of today's class. So if you registered for today's class, we did record it. We will be putting it up onto a YouTube channel and you will be able to watch it again or show it to other students um, that might have an interest in the class. Okay. But without any questions, I'd like to thank every one of you for taking time out of your schedules to watch today's broadcast. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to send us a line and we'll be able to answer those for you. I appreciate you coming to our class today and learning how to very quickly and easily build a shed in Envision Here. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a fantastic day and a great summer. Thank you and goodbye.